welcome along to Writer's Routine. This week we're chatting to Emma Smith. Emma is a professor of Shakespeare studies at the University of Oxford. Her new book, Portable Magic, was shortlisted for the Wolfson History Prize. It's all about books, their power over us as readers, and why we struggle to throw them away. We talk about getting the tone of commercial nonfiction just right, also the questions that she asks herself as she's writing, and as a professor of Shakespeare, we dive into that and find out why his work is still relevant 400 years Years later. When I think about what Shakespeare is, I actually don't just think about the plays that were written uh, at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. I think about that plus all the commentary and adaptation and engagement that's happened since. So it's a kind of 400 year old uh, package. And that it's that energy, that kind of rolling, snowballing kind of energy, which makes it really difficult to go back to the plays themselves and say, kind of, are they worth it? The, th- the truth is they have been thought to be worth it through all these different periods and in all these different places. There is more with Emma Smith in this week's episode of Writer's Routine. Yes, welcome along to the show. This is Writer's Routine, where we take a look through an author's working day. My name is Dan Simpson. Thank you very much for being there. Hopefully lots of tips and advice that can help shape your day on the show. This week's episode of Writer's Routine is brought to you by the new true crime podcast, Who is the Cheese Wire Killer? And I think it's perfect for us, because if you love crime writing and storytelling, which I think that you do, If you love podcasts, which I hope that you do, well, this is right up your street. Who is the Cheese Wire Killer is all about a 1983 murder. It's now regarded as one of Scotland's most gruesome unsolved murders. And across five episodes, through a mixture of documentary and drama, this podcast, the series, goes into the very centre of this live investigation. It's a classic whodunit case that has been baffling the police for over 40 years. The killer is still on the run. And last year, the police announced the biggest step forward in the case. And this podcast goes right into the heart of it. It puts you there as this live investigation goes on with interviews from the senior investigating officer, forensic experts, psychologists, as well as family members and friends of the victim. It's such a brilliant twist on true crime podcasts, something that is going on right now and you can be there helping to solve it. An incredible way of just slightly tweaking the wheel to put you right in the middle of things so you can try and uncover who is the cheese wire killer. You can find the series now. The whole lot is there for you to listen to and binge however you like. Have a listen wherever you get your shows. Search for who is the cheese wire killer and try and solve one of the most famous unsolved murders ever. Now, this week on the podcast, we are chatting to Emma Smith. Emma is a professor of Shakespeare studies at the University of Oxford. She's written many academic non-fiction works before. And Portable Magic, a history of books and their readers, is something else. I think it can be wide-ranging, commercially pretty big. Now, I'll let you in on something. I get a lot of non-fiction books pitched to me in the show. And normally I say no. I- I've tried, and but I normally struggle with the interview a little bit. Plus, I think that you are mostly interested in fiction, right? How novelists plan their day and getting advice on that side of things to help you with your novel. But something about this book, it spoke to me and I think it will to you too, because it's all about their books and their power over us. Exploring the unexpected and unseen consequences of our love affair with books, really. About why we can never throw them away. About what is it? If you're like me, you've got a bookshelf bursting with books that you've read and probably won't read again, save for a few. Why do I still have them? Why can't I throw them away? (laughs) We dive through that. You can hear how a non-fiction author might experience the world around them differently to someone who's writing a novel. Also, how she is inspired by the success of other academics' work. We run through why she spends a lot of time getting the introduction right. It's the first thing a reader will see. It needs to be perfect. How does she make it so? How does she sum up the next 300 odd pages in just one chapter, letting you know what you're there for? We talk about why there are books that we shouldn't destroy and why we are so precious of books as objects. 
Also hear how she writes small first drafts, then expands rather than splurging and shrinking, and whether she worries that that is a sustainable way to write. And I'm, I'm interested in, as a professor of Shakespeare studies, how much teaching a subject every day actually helps her understand it differently 400 years after the work was first published there's a lot going on and i think you'll really enjoy it so let's get into it as we always do finding out what emma smith sees around her in the place where she sits down to write i'm uh, in my office in uh, hartford college in oxford so i look out over the sandy colored limestone of central oxford i'm in a kind of absolutely uh, idyllic spot although uh, a little bit noisy uh Tourists and people taking photographs and uh, enjoying themselves sort of under the under the window, and I'm um, in a terrible mess always. Every book I never put books back on the shelves, um, so every book I pull down for writing um, uh, or for teaching, which I also do in this space, uh, is sort of piled up, uh, piled up around me. Um, and the one time I was on um, TV news, um, uh, they pictured me in this in, 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 at my desk. And my mum uh, texted me and just said, "Tidy your desk." Um, so it's, uh, I'm in a I'm in chaos, uh, enjoyable chaos. Now it's interesting that it's an office in, in a in a college. A lot of writers I speak to will be in their own homes, a place that they are, are allowed to kind of curate as much as they want. And I guess there's an element of that with an office in a college, but I, I can't imagine it's as cosy and as comfy as. You, it might be if you were at home. What have you kind of got around you? What, what are the home touches that you have that kind of set you in that space? So, uh, in I think you know it's a really interesting point. I think in a way, I have uh, chosen this not to be too homely and too comfortable because then that gives me a sense this is what I'm here to do. Rather than I could drift off and make a cup of tea, I could potter around, you know, I could put the washing out. All those um, d- lovely distractions there are for being in your own in, in your own space. This is a bit more, um, a little bit more for me, like like coming to work. Uh, I have got a relatively comfortable sofa, but I pretty much um, forbid myself to sit on it. Um, uh, most of the work I do is uh, is sitting at a desk. That that works better for me. That does raise a, a a question, which might be like wildly uh, misguided, right? But if you were writing fiction, do you think you could write where you are? Is there an element of because you're writing nonfiction, because it's a book of research and study, very like what you do for the day job, really, uh, that you kind of need to feel academic? Whereas I wonder if you were suddenly writing a spy thriller, you would... Me- it, you would do that at home? I don't know if I'm reaching there, Emma. No, I think that's a really interesting observation. So um, not in practical terms, this space has the stuff I need around me because you're quite right. Most nonfiction, you know, has, uh, I think all good nonfiction has elements of, you know, the creative and the, the, the inspired, but it's also got to be based on uh, a whole lot of research. And I've got all that stuff around me. So it's practically right. But I think you're right that it so- sort of psychologically puts me in the headspace to think this is the job I've got to do. I don't think that headspace would be very, um, would, I think it would be a bit inimical to uh, writing in a very different genre, so writing fiction. So maybe if I am uh, prompted to write uh, the novel, um, well, do I think I'd ever write a novel? Probably not. Um, uh, but maybe I would have to write it in a different place. It's interesting that I do. So I don't, um, it doesn't appeal to me quite so much as it does to, to, to some people, the idea of a writing retreat or that you need to be, you know, in, in somewhere very un, uninterrupted. I associate my writing with, with the routines of my working, working life and, and, and some of those spaces. And we will absolutely get to that. But I, I, I I'm just thinking aloud here. Um, my, you know, many people I chat to and many people that listen and, and me, we might have ideas for novels and, and we want to get down and write a book like that. I wonder as, uh, uh, you as a professor at the University of Oxford, um, do you have like novel ideas that you fancy or, or are you only ever thinking really in, uh, writing non-fiction because that's where your curiosity is leading? You're wondering, oh, why does that happen? And whereas for some people, that why might lead to inventions of character and inventions of plot. For you, it's more of a a, a, a 
the answer needs to come factually for you to study it. I, I wonder about that. I recognise. I do recognise what you're what, what you're saying there, um, and I think, yeah, the kinds of inquiry all writers are. are are, are inquirers, aren't they? And they're inquiring after a particular kind of truth um, in fiction and in and in nonfiction. But w- what what counts is different in those in those two two genres. So I think um, abs- absolutely, I'm um, sort of yeah, I'm I'm thinking when I'm thinking about a next book. Uh, even though I, I like everybody, I, I experience the world and sometimes think, God, that's just like a novel or that would make an amazing novel or what an extraordinary location this would be for a, a, a kind of creative story. But I experience my own writing career in terms of uh, nonfiction questions that I want to try and answer. So I don't have a very uh, I don't have a very good routine or rather my routine um, I think is probably quite deadline oriented. So I have uh, a mode that I switch into when I can feel uh, a, a deadline approaching where something has to be, you know, drafted or completed or uh, a version of it has to go somewhere. And then I will be very, very focused indeed on squeezing every moment of writing time uh, out of my day. And once I'm in that headspace, I can write effectively even if i just have like 10 minutes or 15 minutes that's absolutely fine i can hold it in my in in my head but in less it, 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 in the periods where it's not all about getting the words down um i suppose what i'm tending to do is uh read a bit m- make different kinds of uh notes um uh th- you know, have a sort of ongoing list of stuff that I need to find more m- more about. Um, always reading stuff and then getting much more, uh, a much bigger list uh, again to to read. And that's one of the reasons I guess the deadline is helpful to me because I probably I can't get to the end of all my reading. I think that's the case with research for anything. If you're researching fiction, uh, a fiction setting or a historical period for your, for your fiction, or if you're researching nonfiction, you can never do everything. You have to have a point where you say, okay, I've done enough. Um, uh, and for me, the having done enough usually coincides with a, with some, with some kind of deadline. So, you know, I, like everybody at times, I don't manage this, uh, balance between this and other activities. Well, I procrastinate uh, or I get busy with other things and feel I haven't sort of touched base with the writing project uh, at all. And at other times, um, I'm very um, sort of mono singular focused and I'm slightly in that uh, in that mode right now. I've got some stuff I want to get finished by Christmas and so um, uh, that's just a few weeks away. So I'm quite in the in the in the zone. What have you learned whilst writing uh, full books about how you work and how you work best? Uh, this is very hard, perhaps, for you to think about because you're so deadline orientated, right? But if you did have an ideal day and you could plan it around uh, you writing a few thousand words or whatever it is, what do you know about how you work that would set that up best? Like, are you a morning person? Are you, are you much better after a cup of coffee at 2 p.m.? What, what's that? Yeah, so I'm a, yeah, great. So I'm a, I'm a morning person, uh, a decent, a decent cup of coffee. Um, and, uh, but, but I don't drink coffee all, all, all through the day. So I'd have one cup of coffee, short cup of coffee to start. Um, sit, uh, with um uh good light you know su- sunlight um possibly music on can can do that or not not do that um sort of riffling back through uh notes and things that i've been thinking about um and perhaps for me having a sense having quite a clear sense in my mind who i'm writing to or who i'm writing for because that helps me with the with the with the tone um, and it stops my work because of, because I'm from an academic background. The great sort of abiding issue with with academic writing is that it's too, you know, we all know what it is. It's too, it's too academic. It's too uh, abstract. It's too co- overcomplicated. It's a bit jargony. Um, so it's really good for me to have quite a clear sense who 
uh, or what what, what kind of person I I want to write this for. And sometimes I think back to um, uh, event, maybe uh, literary festival events or other kinds of events where uh, I've I've met people who've read my books and thought, yeah, I've got you in mind uh, as I as I write. Well, that must be a really hard thing to do because you know you're writing academic fiction uh, academic uh, non-fiction but it, it's there is a sense of it kind of needs to be commercial right people need to you you and the publishers need to make money out of this so like finding that tone must be really tricky because you know i might be painting with a large brush here but i imagine like a lot of the people that you know are also academics right so so uh, trying to picture a uh, someone who is outside of that world making uh, and making the book accessible for them to read it must be quite tricky i think it's a it, it's been a really fabulous aspect for me of moving from the solely academic form of writing um you know published by university press intended for other academics moving uh, out of that sphere and and moving into a more general um uh, sort of non non fiction uh, space. That's just been it's been completely brilliant for me to try and think about how to communicate uh, with people for whom this is not their technical or professional expertise, but they've got uh, interest and you know huge amounts of experience uh, in the world, and this is something that they might want to a book that they might want to pick up. It seems a great privilege to me actually um, to try and think about writing as communication, and it's made me feel a bit more um, sort of disappointed in a way that academic writing. Um, values communication in itself perhaps uh, a little bit lower than it does other uh, other aspects and has that realization changed what you're thinking of doing in the future like when you when you see massively successful uh, uh quote unquote academic piece uh, books that are out there that that, that take us because uh, and they're written in a very accessible way and it, that's not uh, prohibitive, I guess. It's, it, it doesn't put people off. Has, has that idea that, that has dawned on you changed what you're thinking of writing in the future and how you might work and write in the future? Well, I, I read a lot of um, uh, non, non-fiction in sort of history and literature and culture, the sort of fields that I'm, um, I've, got, I've got a toe in. Uh, and and it's, it's fantastically inspiring. And what I've learned from that I think is to be confident that if you have got a good story to tell and you begin at the right point so that people can get into that story, you don't assume um, that they already know it somehow. So start in the wrong, in in a place which is um, inhospitable to them. You can go a long way. You know, you don't need to. Some of my colleagues sometimes suggest that writing uh, for a for a bit wider audience must be some kind of dumbing down, which is a phrase I completely hate. Uh, I don't recognise it at all, and I, I always say absolutely, absolutely not. It, it requires more thought about you know how you communicate and where you start with. But I've been so inspired by you know massively ambitious books, m- you know much much more ambitious works of non fiction than mine that are exp- you know explaining humanity, you know the history of the world, um, uh, big science. This discoveries and so on. You know, these, this is difficult material, but the, but writers um, can make that completely, compellingly accessible. Uh, that is an inspiration. Well, yeah, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now and there's a copy of Sapiens, which is the Yuval Noah. I was thinking of Sapiens as I was saying yeah, that. Yeah. Right. So, and, and I... Um, I know a few academic people who disagree with some of the points that are made, but it is a testament to if you take a big idea and you do make it accessible, it really can grip the world really. And the amount of people that uh, recommend that book and talk about it is, is quite otherworldly and must be pretty inspiring. Yeah, completely. And then there are unexpected things like, you know, the economist, Thomas Piketty, um, you know, published really quite a tough book, but that people were, in, you know, were interested to try and engage with. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of Peter Frankopan's work. Uh, you know, there, there are loads of great writers in this, in this, space and they are most certainly not um 
s- sort of turning away or, or uh, being too cowardly to address great big difficult issues, and they're confident that readers readers will go with them there. So I suppose yeah, being being um, recognizing that re- writing with a communicative impulse is not about restricting your scope or your ambition. That's been a good thing to learn. Uh, Peter Frankopan, he did the uh, the Silk Roads, which again, if you want an example of of uh, kind of non fiction and academic writing that has taken over, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a brilliant one to do. Uh, now, I, as I say, I know that an ideal day rarely happens because things get in the way and you are very deadline orientated. But if you were to to, uh, to have a day where you could think very clearly and concisely about what you're working on and plan everything around that. What do you like to get done? Is there a word count? Are you just exploring an idea? What happens in that side of things, Emma? So sometimes I would work, want to work to a word count and I get a, a, a thrill out of that. I use, um, uh, I use the um, Scrivener program, which is good. One of the many things it's good for is uh, you can set your targets and it tells you where you are along your targets and everybody needs a bit of um, affirmation uh, about that. So yeah, often I would, I, I would um, work towards a word target. Now that might be words that were in some kind of form that would make it into the into a final draft of what I'm writing. But equally, there might be more freeform words where I just try, almost as if I'm talking to somebody to say, this is, I think, what I'm trying to say, or, you know, to, to, to really um, write more more freely and try and just sometimes unblock or, or, or get that get get going with that but word yeah word word targets are a a good way for me to be motivated and also f- to um again to know when to stop and to think yeah that's that's been a good day um otherwise i think you can always feel you could have done more and that's one way if you're working on a long project um part part of my routine is is having some milestones along the way to feel yeah I am making progress even though the big thing that I'm aiming at is still quite a long way away. Now I'm sorry to keep comparing what you do to fiction writers, but it's kind of what I know, and I'm really interested in in the differences. Many um, novelists I speak to will talk about the various drafts that they do. So the first draft might be a vomit or a dirty draft. You're just telling yourself the story. You're giving yourself the room to change it on the second, third, fourth, fifth draft. Um, when you're writing nonfiction, when you're writing academically, how much do you have that same leeway? Uh, are you able to uh, kind of write things very badly, knowing that you'll fix it later? Maybe leave whole paragraphs blank and say, I'll come back to this and I'll talk about that then. How, how much room or does it need to be pretty pristine first time you do it, mainly because you're a professor at Oxford and that's what you know? I think it's a mixture of those, actually. So I often write and then and leave out a section and think this is where I need to cover this kind of material, but I don't know what that quite is yet. I've got a sense it's going to be this. Um uh, and the thing that I often – I write and rewrite, and this is something that's changed about my – my writing is is thinking about the introduction, thinking about the introduction to the overall book, but thinking about the sort of entry points to all the different parts of the argument. How do you make it so that that is a good place? It is a good place to start, and that draws people into what you want to say. So you can you can go uh, beyond that. So the, the the actual sort of as it were meat of that of a, of a chapter might be written. Um, it, in its almost in its final form in the first draft, but what would for me would keep changing was where's the right entry point to get to this material? Um, what's is there an example? Is there a sort of particular moment? Is there a an analogy maybe that would work with the modern day or something? And that's what I tend to find. I spend a lot of time on on drafting and 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 redrafting. You mentioned introduction there. I um. Now I went to university. No, nothing is n- nothing is as kind of grand as Oxford, uh, but I remember writing essays and being taught how to write essays and the certain beats that you needed to hit. And and I and I wonder how, when you are doing that chapter by chapter, but also over a, a larger three hundred odd page book, how worried you are about. Uh, kind of what we learn about essay writing and academic writing and 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 how formulaic that can appear 
and maybe not making your work like that, or at least not letting readers be able to spot the joints and spot what you're doing. Like, oh, this is the part where I have the introduction. This is where I do this argument and then and all of that. That's a great question. And I think actually writing um, uh, nonfiction in the way that I've done recently has freed that up. You're right that academic writing has quite a clear structure to it. You acknowledge You know, you cover the field, you establish what's been done in this area already, and then you identify where the gap is that you're going to try and, you know, sort of maneuver into. Um, and so that can be quite as, quite a dry, almost due diligence kind of part of your, of your writing where you're proving, yeah, I'm a good person to write about this because I know all this other stuff. Um, and if you write nonfiction, uh, in a way, your, your authority is, you just you you have to try and carry it or you know readers will go with you or they won't but you can't possibly create it in those very academic ways through citing every you know last sort of history of of how these ideas have been thought about over over time so it has been for me a, a um quite a liberating way to get rid of those um that th- some of those structures and and strictures and also to think well t- to draw inspiration from other kinds of writing. So to think, for example, about um, lots of academic writing could be structured like a biography. Um, You know, it's a sort of, it's an idea which has a shape to it, like almost like a life does. So I've been interested in the way people have written biographies and memoirs in very different ways in very different ways. You know, not most biographies don't start, you know, X was born in, you know, December 1590 or whatever they that you know they start with some uh amazing moment or sometimes even start with the death or they're playing with the structure and trying to think about other creative forms and to borrow from them to make non-fiction um sort of readable and tell its story in a compelling way that's been really fun for me and you mentioned earlier language and making it accessible how much thought do you give to finding that right word and what does it need to be because it needs to be intelligent and academic i don't want to read non-fiction that doesn't make me feel smarter but it it can't be off-putting as you say i think what i've tried to do in my own writing is to is to feel that there's a mixture of, of of types of of vocabulary so that um i i I quite often like a, a modern analogy or a quite a modern phrase that's that's in some ways a little bit out of place for what I'm talking about, but might just be able uh, to express that um, a bit a, a little bit better. Um, uh, and s- yeah, so so I'm trying to think about on the one hand more regular, maybe even a bit more spoken forms of uh, f- forms of, of language. There's a there's um. Uh, a phrase in my Shakespeare book that was quoted quite a bit in the reviews where I say the Tudor, it's about uh, Shakespeare's um, history plays, and I say the Tudors were toast. Um, the Tudors had come to the end of their life. You know, Elizabeth didn't have any heirs and all of those things. So it's, it's, it's a serious point, but it's expressed in a, in, in, an, in a sort of non-serious way. So I try to vary a bit, I think, the kinds of language uh, that I use, um, but to... Uh, not to lean in too much to the sorts of very technical vocabulary, which I think are props in a way in the academic, in the theatre of academic writing. And they don't necessarily, uh, I've, I, what I've come to see is you don't really need them. You don't always need them. There are some words which are very specific and then you can introduce readers to them if they need to know them. That's absolutely fine. But many of the words that are standard in my kind of academic life uh, are just unnecessary. <laughs> One of Scotland's most notorious unsolved murders. I was the first scientist to open up these items that had been stored by the police since the time of the crime. And it's always been in my mind for over 40 years that I could have found the guy responsible. I firmly believe that somebody out there knows something. Who is the Cheesewire Killer? Listen to the full series now. 
wherever you get your podcasts. Who is the Cheese Wire Killer is sponsoring the show this week. Have a listen wherever you get your podcasts. And you can sponsor the show yourself. If you have published a book, if you don't think it's got the plugging that it is, it deserves, I know it's incredibly competitive out there, let me do the pushing for you. Uh, you can make that happen by pledging to support the show, patreon.com forward slash writer's routine. It doesn't cost a lot, just a little bit. Every month helps me keep going. It helps me keep bringing you these episodes of this podcast as often as I can. For that, you also get merch. There is bonus content. As I say, there's a way for your book to sponsor this show. And it just helps me put the time into this show that it deserves because I know you want to hear from the best authors as often as possible. If you have learned anything in almost 300 episodes that has helped the way that your book is being planned that helps the way that your day looks well you can uh, pledge and support become a backer of the show over at patreon.com forward slash writers routine i'd love to see you there let's get back to it then with emma smith talking about her new book portable magic a history of books and their readers in this part we chat about how much non-fiction authors know about what they're writing before they start Also, Emma is a professor of Shakespeare studies at the University of Oxford. We chat about how much teaching a subject helps it understand it differently. And big one, we try and uncover who William Shakespeare really was. Many people doubt what evidence suggests. Could a normal person in the 16th century really have had all that knowledge? We find out and we get back to it chatting through the very first idea for the book. You know, I think it may have been um, from one of the examples that I write, do write about in the book. It did make it into the book, but it's actually not from a book at all. It's from a film. Uh, and it's from the film The Day After Tomorrow. I don't know if you remember it. It's a sort of climate apocalypse uh, film. And it uh, New York is, is covered with uh, ice and snow. Everything's gone gone mad. Uh, in the climate. And uh, it has this scene in the New York Public Library where the people who have survived this um, uh, end of times are gathered together and they're making a fire and they're making a fire burning the books. And there's a moment where the um, librarian says, you're not burning this one. Um, it's a Gutenberg Bible. So a, a very a very early example of the pr- printed form in Europe. And this is, you know, so valuable that you're not going to burn it. And they're saying to him, well, who, ca- you know, who cares? Um, we're going to die. Uh, who cares about this great, great book? And I was really interested in why that was there in the, in, in the, uh, in, in this, in this movie. Uh, and I felt I just felt found it really really fascinating as a an image a, a different image from the one we usually have about burning books but burning books is something which I was sort of already quite fascinated by and I think the whole book grew out of that why why are the books that we should that we feel we shouldn't destroy or that if they do get destroyed that is an injury which is more than just the destruction of an object it's something a bit more anthropomorphic or something uh, and and around that i built a book which is about why books as objects not not necessarily as content but as objects themselves what why and how they have come to matter to us so that pings the bit of your brain that wants to find out more that wants to investigate um what happens next then? So much that you can research. How on earth do you decide where you should start, where you should look, maybe what what type of book this is going to become? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. So with that one, I uh, I thought, well, I don't really know as much about Gutenberg as I ought to do. So I'm going to try and find out about Gutenberg. Um, I actually was um, writing quite a lot of this book uh, when libraries were shut, which are one of my other normal habitats. Uh, so I did a lot of the research for it online. I would normally research more with physical books, but it's a lot of research online. I looked at copies and pictures and digital versions of of Gutenberg's Bible online, but then I also found out, (coughs) excuse me, found out as much as I could about his... The development of printing, I learned that he didn't invent printing. He brings it from uh, from Korea and, and China. So that story about Europe inventing this technology is one of those um, actually now quite familiar ways that Europe gives itself the credit for things that uh, actually um, first emerged in other parts of the world. Um, so then I started to sort of think through um, uh, what to put, what else to put with 
uh, with that um, with that example and how to think about books that were um, sort of f- felt like land landmarks in in cultural uh, life or something. So I tried. I think in terms of writing, one of one of my friends once said to me that. Um, uh, maybe this is true as a fiction writer too. I don't know. As a non-fiction writer, you either sort of write up to what you need, or you you cut down. You know, you you, you write quite in quite a quite a limited word limited way and build up to what you where you're trying to get to, or you splurge out a whole load of stuff and then your main job is editing. And I'm definitely in the first category. I, I work. I write up, um, and sometimes I will write quite a condensed paragraph or page and and really that will what i need to do is is expand that outwards and and give it a bit more air and a bit more breathing space is that a bit tricky because the worry with that style is that you are you're almost filling i think to a degree like if you know that this book requires 80,000 words or whatever it is and you can if if you are building up a paragraph are you ever worried about well, waffling. Well, well, the, the act that you're just padding it out because you need this to be more than it is. Um, I think that's a real. I think that is definitely, definitely there. I mean, sort of payment by by words. Um, you can see that in Victorian newspapers and stuff, and it, it it isn't good for. It definitely isn't good for the for the clarity or the style of that those reports. I think um, what I'm tending to do, I think. Uh, is to realize that the that the 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 expression i've got of my idea is too condensed and it does it needs not waffle around it i mean that that that's the danger but i think it's not usually waffle it needs um some kind of uh uh, it, it just, yeah, it just, I can't think of a different image for it, really. It just needs to be a little bit more spacious. It needs to be paced a little bit better. Um, but one of the things I do much later on in, in my, um, in my writing is to think if I needed to lose 500 words from this, could I do it? And usually you can. And therefore, usually it's a good thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a really, Good question to ask yourself at all points, I think, and especially, especially towards the end. Now, when I, again, right, plotting a, a fiction book, you're going on the journey as a writer. You are discovery. I once spoke to the author Anne Cleves, crime writer, who said that she never wants to know what's happening because why would she want to write and read this twice? She wants to discover it at the same time as a reader. Uh, how much can you know? Do you have to know the full thing before you start writing? Because this is a work of fiction, an essay, a long, long, long one. So you need to have an accurate idea about what's happening. How much do you know before you start writing? I don't think, I think that's a bit different in a way, maybe from from some of my sense, apprehension of how fiction might work. I don't think in nonfiction that you, that I know the the direction or the content that the work is going to is going to go through that just depends on the research and the and the writing and what seem to be the examples that sing most brightly uh, i might know the overall uh question or the overall area to investigate but i don't i definitely don't know the shape the shape of the book and thinking about um the, the the book portable magic is is an, is a lot of quite short chapters um and they're designed to be that they do relate to each other but they don't they don't unfold necessarily in the order that they uh, appear in the book you could you could drop in and out of the book and that was a deliberate part of its of its design um that's quite different from planning um a, a more organic kind of structured book which needs to go from one place uh to 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 another portable magic i think of more as kind of concentric circles or something uh circling around the same point but all each each with their own orbit and that they could be taken out separately so uh, the, for the planning that there was does it work that you have the idea then you do the research and then you think all right i've got all this research what can I do with it? How can I make this into some form of structure? Or is it more that you've got the idea, you're going to start writing and ideas might ping off that you need to read this, and you need to research that? 
Yeah, I think it's the second. So I think this is my idea. Um, I'd like to write something which is broadly on this topic. Um, I'm going to start to read around the things, you know, this is the stuff I already know about it, but h- here are the areas that I don't know. So, for example, for portable magic, I knew a fair bit about the uh, history of books uh, in the printed period. So over the last 500 years, say, in in England or in Europe. I didn't really know anything about books before print, and I certainly didn't know anything about books uh, in other countries and how those histories might um, complicate what I was talking about or enrich it in different ways. Uh, So that was a big area that I needed uh, to find out more about. And And finding out more about that obviously then did change what seemed important uh, in in making a more uh, a more inclusive history of of this object and you mentioned earlier on the the creativity and the invention. How did you balance that out with the research when you are writing it how How much kind of time and thought are you giving to a really brilliant way of talking about this you You have a purpose right you need to to talk about what you've learned and what you're asking and, and the research that you're doing but doing that in a in a beautiful way with with kind of a style of prose how did you approach that i think i uh i sometimes read out what what i what i've written after i've written it um that's a um something i was taught to do quite early as a as a student um and i it's one way that I, my eye doesn't just glide over the stuff on the screen. You know, once you've, once you've written something, it can be really, really hard to um, discipline yourself to look at it again properly. So reading it aloud is one of the ways that, um, uh, that helps me. And one of the things I notice when I'm reading is if I stumble a lot over what I'm saying, or if I realize I don't really know how to pronounce this word or, that just seems very, very convoluted. It helps with a more authentic voice for me, I think. Um, and sometimes with other books, although not with this one, I have been able to uh, give a- elements of the book as talks or as lectures, and that's done the same the same kind of thing. Uh, it's to get a, a voice that's not necessarily um, beautiful, but maybe is clear and is... Uh, Maybe it has a bit of humour in it. That's quite important to me in how I in, in how I try and communicate. There's such a lot of creativity, modern creativity, be it in the theatre, in other kinds of writing, in all kinds of art forms, actually, in translation uh, and so on, which are being sort of prompted by or, or stimulated by engagement with Shakespeare. So adaptations of Shakespeare I'm really interested in. But I'm also interested in how we make Shakespeare talk about... Uh, but, you know, when we cast Shakespeare's plays, uh, when we choose the actors who are going to play those roles, we're making a statement about who is um, part of literary culture and this high English icon and so on, and sometimes in ways which which audiences uh, find co- controversial. You know, if you're talking about the culture wars in the UK, it's almost always going to be a Shakespeare point that, that kicks off uh, kicks off something. So I do really find that uh, a fascinating aspect uh, of this of this study. My students are interested in different things than they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, and that means that I, you know, keep up with, keep up with them. Um, yeah. So it's, a, it, it's a really, um, it's a very, yeah, it's a very lively uh, field to be in. What is it about Shakespeare's work that means it still has relevance 500 years on? If, if there weren't, yeah, you know, this is this might be a trite question. If there weren't people like you researching and teaching, if it wasn't still on stage and on telly and movies with adaptations, does the work in itself justify its presence as still being as relevant as big as it is, or have we do we all kind of have this collective view that well, it's Shakespeare, so it must be brilliant and it must be relevant? There's a bit of the second, uh, if I'm honest. Um, and I saw that most, um, 
I saw that most clearly actually when there was um this is a bit of a niche reply but there was a uh, a big scholarly uh, discussion and debate about a play called Edward the Third, which we didn't used to think was by Shakespeare. We didn't know who it was by. And these scholars worked in all kinds of different ways to try and prove that it was by Shakespeare. And m- many people um, kind of accept that, that it, that it is a, it is a Shakespeare play that was not um, attributed to him in his lifetime. And certainly once it was attributed to Shakespeare, people started to find it a lot better. It was the same play as it had always been, but more interesting, more worthwhile. Uh, it got it got staged for the first time probably for three or 400 years, you know, those kinds of things. So there's definitely a way that the Shakespeare label confers value rather than being generated by value, if you like. But I do think that there is something uh, – When I think about what Shakespeare is, I actually don't just think about the plays that were written uh, at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. I think about that plus all the commentary and adaptation and engagement that's happened since. So it's a kind of 400-year-old package. And that it's that energy, that kind of rolling, snowballing kind of energy, which makes it really difficult to go back to the plays themselves and say, kind of, are they worth it? The, the truth is they have been thought to be worth it through all these different periods and in all these different places. And what we've got, what we've inherited is the kind of sum of all those of all those engagements. Well, I was going to ask, actually, Emma, sorry to interrupt, but has has that energy always been there? So in the 1700s, in the 1800s? Have everyone has everyone always been enthused about the work, or is it a bit like uh, Christmas, which kind of died out, and and the idea is that Charles Dickens kind of pushed that uh, the enthusiasm for it again? Is is it something similar with Shakespeare, or is 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 it always been right at the forefront of our collective consciousness? You're really right to pick me up on that. This is not a consistent picture ac- ac- across time. Um, uh, in the in the 1700s, people uh, admire Shakespeare, but they think that in order to be uh, stage worthy for modern for moderns you know for um seventeen hundred people uh they need to be adapted they need to be updated they don't want to be quite so old fashioned so uh Shakespeare survives that period through being adapted rather than through the the originals being particularly valued yeah in the eighteenth century uh we we get the statue of Shakespeare in poet's corner in Westminster Abbey at the beginning of the eighteenth century and that's a big marks a big shift in how Shakespeare's seen, interestingly seen as a poet rather than a than a than a dramatist. You know, poetry is higher status than 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 drama at the time. And then through the 18th century, yeah, Shakespeare is really on a on a roll. But it's not all plays uh, at all times. You know, plays go in and out of fashion. We've had a big Me Too moment, which has been interested in Measure for Measure, sort of a comedy, a not very comic comedy about sexual consent. That's a play which uh, whole generations of people just thought this is a bit off. We don't really know what to do with this. It's not. It's not like a proper romantic comedy. Uh, it's a bit sleazy, but now it turns out to be the you know one of the plays of the moment, and that's happened a lot through through the history of Shakespeare's uh, works that they have gone in and out of relevance. So not all of Shakespeare has been thought to be relevant at all times, but uh, but at many times in history and at many places, and in many places in the globe, um, some Shakespeare has seen to resonate with contemporary concerns. So Derek Jacobi and Mark Rylance, right, huge Shakespearean actors, are two of the main uh, proponents of the the, the conspiracy that he is not just one man, right? That they believe, I think one of them is that he is the figurehead for a large group of writers back in the day. I just wonder what, what you think about that conspiracy and idea. So I don't think there's any evidence to doubt all the evidence that there is that Shakespeare of Stratford, who was also an actor, wrote the plays that we attribute to Shakespeare. Um, that it, it, it's a big, you'd have to disregard a huge amount of contemporary evidence in order to ask the question uh, in the in the first place. But I think what is really interesting about that whole uh, conspiracy theory or that whole investigation is what kind of what is giving us for Shakespeare that we don't already have? And sometimes that's about a Shakespeare who is more upper class. Most of the people who are suggested as alternative authors for Shakespeare are noble noblemen. 
Um, uh, and sometimes a Shakespeare who's more political or better connected um, or, or, or something like that. So these are arguments which I don't think are based on very much factual evidence, but which people feel very, very, very passionately about. And I think that must be because they tell them something about the image of Shakespeare that's important, that feels important to them. Yeah, it's almost, it's almost classist, right? Is there, is there an elitism where people think, well, uh, this can't possibly be written by who it was. Surely it must be written by someone of higher status back then. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of that. There's a, th- th- there's a lot of that. Nobody has um, uh, replaced Shakespeare with another ordinary uh, Elizabethan uh, as Shakespeare was. So these are, in, in some ways, you could say these are problems. This is the problem about genius. You know, how did Mozart or Bach write their music? How did Shakespeare uh, write his plays? You know, how does you know wh- whoever you think is a is an artistic genius? And the, the, there is some way you can answer that question by saying. Well, this was their background, and this was what they learned, and this is, you know, where who was inspirational to them. And some of it, you just have to say they were incredibly gifted, and who knows where that comes from. Uh, and I, I, I'm always aware that a, cr- a constant criticism people, well, a constant idea that they have around this conspiracy is that he, his plays, and that they give quite a breadth of knowledge that they're very skeptical that he could have. You know, uh, kind of. Uh, about jaunts around Italy and and stuff that they are very cynical that someone like that could have had. But I don't know, maybe, you know, would it be perfectly fine for someone in the late 1500s to know all of that without it, it being a surprise? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting that Shakespeare, Shakespeare's plays show very, very little knowledge of Italy at all. He takes the stories from pre-existing sources, which are Italian, so he inherits the sources. But there's a really great example for me, which is a quite a slam dunk example, I think. Um, everybody who went to Venice at the end of the 16th century was really fascinated by the area of Venice, which was the original ghetto. And the ghetto was the place where the Jewish community of Venice had to live and where there was a curfew and they had to be in in at night. And every, this, this doesn't appear in any other city. And everybody's really fascinated by this as a way of managing, you know, different peoples, different faith groups, all that kind of thing. Uh, now, Shakespeare writes a play about the merchant of Venice uh, in which a Jewish moneylender, Shylock, is a major character, but he never mentions the ghetto. And he, if he had been to Venice... It's, it's inconceivable to me that he wouldn't have thought. Well, it's obvious where Shylock lives. He lives in the ghetto, and the ghetto is a you know is a, exactly the kind of word which would have appealed, new word which would have appealed to Shakespeare. So from that, I get the idea that the person who wrote *The Merchant of Venice* had never been to Venice. Right. Last question. So uh, with the book *Portable Magic*, obviously, I would like people to read the book. But in in in, in a nutshell, kind of what did you learn uh, in your research about? the significance of actual books, as you say, not the content, but just what they are physically. And why are we always so outraged when books are burned of all things? And, and we, you know, and I've got a bookshelf here, stuff full of books that I've read and will never reread, but it feels much more sacrilegious to throw them away than it is to throw anything else out. What is that about? I completely agree. And sacrilegious is a great word. So uh, f- for this, I think. So I learned uh, two, two main things. I think the two main takeaways, um, let's have them here now so people who are time poor don't need to read the book. The first is, I think books themselves, that's to say, pages gathered together between covers rather than scrolls or other forms of writing, they develop with Christianity. So the first books um, are religious books. And there's a there's a link, lovely link between sort of bibliography, bibliophile, bibliotheque in French and Bible. Uh, they all come from the same root. You know, books are Bibles, Bibles are books and so on. Um, I think that as books have developed into all kinds of other categories of writing, you know, most books are not about religious content now. Nevertheless, the objects themselves have retained some of that original quality they had because our first books were were religious, were Bibles. And the second thing I think I learned was um, – there's a lot of emphasis on how beautiful and um, important, valuable or rare old books are. 
in my field, it would be the first collected edition of Shakespeare, the first folio in 1623, or it would be the Gutenberg Bible or something that we've already talked about. And what I realized, and I realized a lot talking to people was, um, lots of people have a, have a book that's really, really valuable to them as an object, the smell, the feel of it. Quite often it's a book they had in childhood, maybe, or that they associate with somebody in their family or a particular time, uh, in their lives. And that those books, uh, are embodying this thing I call bookhood um, as much as a big valuable book in a museum or library. And we're, are we, are we taught this from parents without realising it? So the idea that books are very important, we can't throw books away without, without understanding that they're doing it. Are, are, are they imparting it down? I just, I just find it like, but I just, cause I just find it slightly baffling that, you know, I'll bring up these books again. No one has ever told me, that I need to keep these books and that they look beautiful. And it might be uh, relevant to religion from way back when books started being bound. No one has ever told me that. So I just wonder, like, culturally, where this where, where this meme is, to use the actual, you know, the Richard Dawkins use of the word meme, like the zeitgeist, where does that come from? It's interesting, isn't it, to think whether it does come from people in, instructing children to be careful with books and to treat them gently. Um, maybe, maybe some of us learn about our first books from library books, and they, you know, they don't belong to us, and they need to be kept in good condition. So maybe there's a, maybe there is some sense that the book is a is a fragile object which which should be which should be respected. Maybe we get that uh, earlier on, as you say, without even without even really realizing it. But it is really striking how many people find um respond very very uh, passionately indeed to the idea of a book being damaged or thrown away or cut in half or folding down the corners of the pages those kinds of things you know people feel this is a as a, um, a, an attack on something animate not not just on a block of paper And that's it for this week's episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for Emma Smith for coming on the show. That new book is Portable Magic, A History of Books and Their Readers. If you don't read much nonfiction, I think this might be a good entry point for you. It's academic in a brilliantly readable way. This week's episode of the podcast is sponsored by Who is the Cheese Wire Killer? Brand new true crime podcast that you can listen to wherever you get your shows. You can also support us becoming a backer at patreon.com forward slash writers routine make sure you give us a follow on x as well we are at writers pod over there and you can get in touch using the contact page at writersroutine.com and i will see you next week with a brand new author on the show until then thanks for listening bye (laughs) 